We like to get started by making the sound of OM together, which takes us down into our, uh, our spiritual center. So we'll get prepared by taking three deep breaths and getting our feet in touch with Mother Earth. And with a deep in breath. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. today. Is Hello, Sam. Called the, yo the Yoga of the Royal Secret or the Secret of Life from the Bhagavad Gita, which as Reverend Russ said today is translated as the Song of the Lord, the song, the song in the ancient sense of a poem, Song of the Lord. I use the book, The Living Gita by Sri Swami Satchidananda and his commentary. And today we're also going to reference another version of the Bhagavad Gita. This is actually the one Rev. Russ took with him when he went to Florida on the beach. It's the translation by Stephen Mitchell, the poet and also the Buddhist. He, I think, spent 10 years in Japan in a Buddhist retreat or coming back to the States, translating not only the Bhagavad Gita, but the, the Song of David and the Tao Te Ching and other works. Wonderful man. We're going to start studying the Bhagavad Gita in our, in our Thursday night class. And it's, it's actually another translation. I don't know which one it is yet. I recommend that you review different translations and see which ones work for you. Some of the translations are more literal, trying to uh, copy the uh, Sanskrit words and English, and some are more invested in the spirit of the work. So if the translation you pick is it all cumbersome? You might want to uh, check some of the other translations. Jean Marie has worked with the one that she does, mm -hmm. and she's very spiritual. I mean, she's not going to get literal on us. Good. <laughs> There's anything right. literal about her at all. All right. So, I would like. Hi, Janice. There's your coffee over there <clears throat> on the table. We've been studying the Bhagavad Gita for quite a while. So we have some history behind us. And we're going to jump into chapter 9. We've already been through eight chapters. I've designed these Sunday lessons so that they stand on their own. So if you have background, good. If you don't, that's also good. We're going to start with... Uh, I'm sorry, but this, that, that's the one to do. Oh, thank you, Susan. Uh, by Jack Hawley, A Walk Through for Westerners. 
Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, chapter 9. Last week, we studied the royal secret, or the secret of life, and we looked at Satchitananda's translation of the Gita. And I looked over Stephen Mitchell's translation, and I found out that, for me, it works better to investigate it. So we're going to look at Mitchell's translation of the Gita. Here we go. The Blessed Lord said, and in these works, the Blessed Lord is Lord Krishna, who is an incarnation of the, of the Lord. Just as some hold that Jesus was an incarnation of God in our Western tradition. The Blessed Lord said, Because you trust me, Arjuna. Now remember the scene of this. The scene is the Lord is speaking to you and me. You and me. In the person of Arjuna, the warrior, who was supposed to go into battle and had some second thoughts when his mind started talking to him and he got confused. And he asked his spiritual guide, Lord Krishna, for guidance. So here's Lord Krishna giving him guidance. We're on the ninth chapter of guidance. <laughs> A lot of guidance. The Blessed Lord said, Because you trust me, Arjuna, I will tell you what wisdom is. The secret of life, know it. The secret of life, or we could call it the royal secret. Know it and be free of suffering forever. That's quite a promise, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We've all, I'm guessing, have had some occasions of suffering. Something happened and we suffered. Here the scriptures are telling us, once we know the secret of life, what wisdom is, we can be free from suffering forever. I'm going to suggest that maybe suffering might turn up for us, but we won't be so attached to it, as Reverend Russ talked about in the sermon today. So we might be able to experience some suffering and at the same time be able to step back from it and view it from a different place. And then, perhaps, suffering on its own, as we view it from a different place, will disappear and we'll be free of it. In all of this spiritual work, there is no sort of defining moment when you go from unenlightened to enlightened. There are stages and there are uh, different appropriate ways of holding things in the various stages. I'll try and point that out as we look at these scriptures. So depending where we are on our spiritual path, uh, different practices are appropriate. But the promise here is, I'm going to tell you what wisdom is, the secret of life, so that you can be free of suffering forever. Wow. Wow. What a promise. This is the supreme wisdom, the knowing beyond all knowing. So what's the knowing beyond all knowing? Where do we know things? In our intellect. Rev. Russ talked about it in the sermon today, didn't he? He said when we combine our intellect with fear and anger and so on, we don't necessarily have uh, welcome outcomes. When we combine our intellect with love, 
What did he say that was? Wisdom. Wisdom. Combining our intellect with love is wisdom. So perhaps that's the knowing beyond knowing. When we combine our intellectual knowing beyond knowing, that's that's the love, perhaps. Hmm? This is the supreme wisdom, the knowing beyond all knowing, experienced directly in a flash, eternal and a joy to practice. We can experience that knowing beyond knowing in a flash. And we may forget it. We may need more than one flash. But it can come as an aha. I got it. Aha. Experience directly as a flash, eternal, and a joy to practice. Eternal. Now, let's just stop for a moment. What does eternal really mean? Eternal has nothing to do with time. Eternal has to do with being fully present. When we are fully present in the present moment, that's eternity. What you used to think was eternity is just a thought in your mind. Well, it started a long time ago. It's going to keep going on for a long time. True eternity is being fully present. That's eternity. So you can experience the knowing be all knowing in a flash, eternal. That's all that's present for you and a joy to practice. In other words, it's no effort. There's no shoulds or shouldn'ts to practice it. It just springs up like a wellspring from the heart. It's a joy to practice the supreme wisdom. Number four. So here we go. This is the secret you've been waiting for. <laughs> with the, a little <laughs> a secret of life. The royal secret. A little different translation. I permeate all the universe in my unmanifest form. Now, what is manifest? Manifest are all the things we see and we hear and we touch. Think about unmanifest really boggles the mind. It's just not something we see, hear, or have even have thoughts about. We have thoughts about the manifest. Unmanifest, not manifestation. Now right away it takes us into something mysterious. I permeate the universe in my unmanifest form. All beings exist within me, yet I am so... So let's get that. All beings exist within me. All beings exist within me. I see something manifest in the giant body of the whole Lord. We're all existing there. But somehow we have to imagine that as being unmanifest. All beings exist within me, yet I am so inconceivably vast, so beyond experience, that though they are brought forth, and sustained by my limitless power, I am not contained in them. Not wholly contained in them. So that's the secret. Secret of life. Maybe it's not a secret. Maybe we've heard this before. Mm -hmm. So maybe the real secret is there is no secret. But this is what the scriptures say. The unmanifest Lord permeates the universe. Vast. All things are brought forth and sustained by my limitless power. And yet I am not contained in them, or wholly contained in them. Questions before we go on? 
I can see my pictures. I can see this huge potential, potentiality, huge everything. It's just pure potentiality. And inside this that thing of potentiality are things that are manifest. And they're all in this field of potentiality. But the whole field of potentiality isn't inside all these manifest things. It's the other way around. So that seems my mind worked that out. And our minds are going to have images, aren't they? Yeah. Our mind will naturally have yeah. an image. And the scriptures will continually remind us uh -huh. that whatever your mind comes up with, well, not, not, not that. <laughs> it's not all not it is. That. And yet these yeah. images are welcome uh, waypoints on our spiritual yeah. journey to assist us so that we can one day arrive at, well, not that, and be okay with, with not that. These words have to work through our minds <laughs> to get, get somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, um, I had prepared two exercises. We did the first one. And we didn't get around to the second one. I thought we'd do the second exercise today. I like exercises because they help us to internalize these teachings and not just have them be uh, inside of us. Last week, we did an exercise where we visualize the whole universe from our breath being filled with light. Remember that? We did a little middle meditation, and we visualized our breath bringing forth the whole universe, filling it with light, and then we visualized the breath bringing total peace, total peace, Paul Shanti, total peace. That was the exercise. And what is total light? It's another way of thinking of. God or the unmanifest. Maybe light, total light is a little closer to unmanifest than a body filled with things. Anyway, useful uh, images to help us on our spiritual path. Okay. Uh, then last week, we went over some very beautiful scriptures from the Bhagavad Gita describing what the deity is. I am, I am this, I am that, and so on. I am the rain, I bring the rain, I withhold the rain. Everything, all the I am's. We're going to skip that today because I want to get to the next session section so that we can get into the second exercise. Another sloka. I have a question about yes, go right ahead. You know, about um, earlier in my passage on the see it's like the end of suffering. So, isn't that also what I saw Buddha like taught about? Of and course. I said also reminded me about the noble eightfold path. Of and, course. Hmm. I know one aspect of that is that we. Um, is interbeing and how we're all like interconnected and yes yeah like our like we as humans we depend on like other non-human things like you know like plants and other entities to mm -hmm. survive and um mm. so it seemed to me that was more like a not like a simplified explanation <laughs> of things just see that oh, we're all, you know or yes. all in manifest form but I believe that there's like more details to add in terms of how it actually like works out. How it works out, yeah. And how it works out I think yeah. is individual for each of us. Mm -hmm. So we come to classes like this and get new information and see which things sort of land for us so that we can develop our own practices mm -hmm. since through the practices we gain proficiency. As Satchitananda would say, we all 
or headed towards or would like to experience peace, absolute peace all the time, which would mean the suffering, the suffering. So how, how do we get there? Satchitananda also said, truth is one and paths are many. So these Hindu scriptures <coughs> lead to the truth, or Buddhist teachings lead to the truth, Christianity, Islam, Judaism all lead to the truth. And the core of all the religions, teachings, is the same. The core is the same. Did you know, or if you think about it, when uh, Jesus was alive, there was no Christianity, was there? There was just a man who taught, and people followed him. When Buddha was alive, there was no Buddhism. There was just a man who taught, and people followed him. The same thing is true for Muhammad. When he was alive, there was no Islam. Rather, Muhammad was very familiar with the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition. And he actually incorporated those traditions in his teachings. So he taught that there was no Islam. Later on, people said, oh, that's Christianity, that's Judaism, that's Islam, that's Buddhism, and here's how they're different. So the people made them into different religions. Because there's some tendency in us to see each other as separate, whereas all the traditions teach, teach unity, not separation. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Well, they do, but they also, I just like emphasize different, different like principles. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, so I know that, like in Buddhism, from what I read it, I emphasize on um, uh, I guess like freedom from suffering and yes, yeah, by your, you know, like being mindful about your suffering and identifying the causes of it, you know, yes. you know the freedom. But then, um, I guess if I talk to like most Christ Christians in terms of like suffering, they might uh, talk about it more like uh, like praying to God and like receiving wisdom from God and mm -hmm. guidance from God and not. Uh, could be like a way to create like end your suffering so um and so i guess it might emphasize more like obedience right? obedience yeah mm -hmm. yeah so although i guess i guess in a way they might be somewhere in the past they have like different they emphasize like different aspects of it oh yes yeah. different aspects are emphasized mm -hmm. Different nuances on the path. Different nuances. Now, it's up to us to be discerning. Be discerning in the following way. If we find one tradition or one technique works for us, it doesn't mean that the other person's technique is no good. Or that it's our job to fix them and change them and bring them into uh, our technique. So the Christian tradition has a great uh, tradition of proselytizing and going out and getting new converts. So in Islam, it's the same. They copy that from the Christian tradition. And yet the base of all these religions is that we are one. So somehow we have to be discerning that proselytizing doesn't mean putting down another person's spiritual path or way, but rather respecting it and still having our own ways be special for us. Hmm? So that's the challenge. We see today in the social media how 
some religions are cast as not as good as other religions, or maybe bad. Hmm? We see that uh, in the public discourse. Our way which is good, and their way which is bad. And then there's some other ways which we don't comment on. So can we respect in all the traditions, that the core of them, the source is them, heading towards the same truth as one. It's just people are attracted to different paths, either through study, or through upbringing, or through their community, and their love of being part of a, a community. Ready for some more slogans? Isn't it nice that we get to choose? <laughs> Here we go. Well, the, the simplistic one in modern days is the sitting with the silence of mindfulness. I find that another way to get there. Sitting with the silence of mindfulness. Yes, a wonderful technique. Or when we own together. Yes. <laughs> Or listen to music. Years ago, Janice and I went to Russia. We had a wonderful trip to Russia, and we went down, uh, wasn't the Volga, another river there, and we stopped in a small village, and there was a Russian monastery there. We went inside, and all the monks there performed for us in our honor, and they chanted these beautiful Russian. Uh, chants. And for them, that chanting, in my experience of it, was the same experience I get when we make the sound of OM together. Mm -hmm. Chanting. You could see the chanting took them into a different consciousness. Different consciousness. Thank you, Sam. Here we go. 22nd verse. I provide everything for the person who wants me above everything else. So the Lord is saying, I provide everything for the person who wants me above everything else, and we need to look at how to, uh, to make that work for us in our lives. And who constantly thinks of me. But here's the issue. We all have minds. Our minds are full of thoughts. Are those thoughts thoughts of uh, the divine constantly? Possibly not. The promise is I provide everything for the person who wants me above everything else and who constantly thinks of me. I add to what he or she already has and comfort him or her with absolute security. When you're absolutely secure, there's no suffering otherwise. So there we go. How to constantly think of the Lord. When we're involved in our day-to-day -day affairs, we're doing our taxes, we're going to school, we're going to work, we're with our family, especially when we're with our family. Who thinks so <laughs> God when we're with our family? We're all reactivated. Christmas, Thanksgiving, at least I am. I react to some uh, childhood thing of myself where I react a certain way with my sister and children doesn't seem like I'm thinking of the Lord constantly. So we need some spiritual practices, just like you talked about practices. How to think of the Lord constantly while still having our mind be occupied and one-pointed on what it is we're doing. Actually, if you can be truly present and what you're doing when you're eating breakfast. If all you're doing is eating breakfast, 
chewing the toast, tasting the cereal, sipping the hot drink. If that's all you're doing. In a sense, that is constantly thinking of God. When you are totally in the present moment, that's divine. When you get distracted from the present moment, that's when you're in distraction. There are practices of one-pointed mindfulness which help us stay in the present moment. When you're driving on 66, you're driving on 66. You're not thinking about where you came from, where you're going. Feel the steering wheel. Feel your feet on the pedals. How many of us are totally in that present moment when we're driving? Be totally present in moments. Another important practice is to be totally present when you're speaking to someone. This is a challenge for many of us. We're with someone, we're speaking, we hear what they say. We don't agree with what they say. <laughs> Our opinion is different. So, rather than listen to what the person says, we begin constituting our response as to how we're right and they're wrong. And maybe we also think about how we want to do it subtly so it doesn't seem like we're forcing our view on them. Rather, just shedding light on someone who's in the darkness. So we're not present with that person, are we? Bless you. God bless you. There's a wonderful story about being present with a person. Can you be so present with another person, which in a way is giving them your total respect? Total respect. Doesn't mean you agree with them or disagree with them. It's got nothing to do with that. Rather, you just respect and are in total connection with them. So that separateness seems to dissolve and oneness sort of appears without you thinking about it. You're so much in tune with that person and what they're saying that even if a parrot lands on their head, according to one story, <laughs> you don't notice the parrot. You're just in love what they're saying. And after they finish talking, you can say, oh, I got it. By the way, did you know there's a parrot on your head? <laughs> <laughs> And that's another way of experiencing the divine all the time, being present. We need more than one technique because we have different challenges. We talked about two techniques in previous classes, remember? Two techniques for uh, constantly thinking of the divine. We'll do the third one in a few moments. But I'll remind you of what the other two techniques were. One technique is hmm, to make everything an offering to God. Make everything you do, well, make, I make what I'm saying to you right now with my mouth through the help of my intellect an offering to God. I offer it to God. To take the taste of the food in my mouth and make that an offering to God. Thank you, God. To even take the thoughts that show up in my mind and make those an offering to God. I offer these thoughts to you, neither good or bad, doesn't matter. I offer them to you. That's one technique. Then we have to see what lands for us. The second technique we studied and tried on for size was to imagine that there is no more an I or a you or a them. There is only God, and everything that happens is God's doing. I'm not talking. God is talking through me. God speaking the words in my mouth. See God making my tongue wag and my lips move, putting the vibrations in the air, 
God is vibrating the sounds in your ears. God is converting those sounds into the thoughts that are in your head. God is putting the thoughts in your head. God is sitting in your chair. God's eyes are looking out at everything. There's no more individual doing. So the ego goes away. God is doing everything. These techniques are sometimes useful when, um, for example, you experience anxiety. You get anxious about something. Something makes you... I get anxious about things all the time. Sometimes I think I'm a sensitive person. Well, I think everyone experiences anxiety. And sometimes when I experience anxiety, even over the smallest of things, sometimes I remember to remind myself, oh, this is God's anxiety revealed through me. This is God's anxiety revealed through me. Somehow I don't feel quite as anxious anymore. <laughs> this is God's anxiety. That's how I sometimes use that practice. So we're going to practice another technique in a few minutes. Let's, let's get to it. Commentary. What a great promise the Lord makes. The last part is very pleasing to the ear, isn't it? God provides everything for you and protects you. Everything for you and protects you. When? Only when you worship him alone. So that's our challenge. We just talked about some ways of worshiping him alone or being in the divine presence. Thinking of nothing else. Well, sure, the mind can go and think some other thoughts. But we're always prepared to step back. You know, we don't want to disable our beautiful intellect. It's wonderful. It helps us do all the things we do. So, but there's a part of us that can always step back, think of nothing else. It's very hard to achieve, Satchitananda says, but worth it. He says, want me more than anything else. So if that's what we want more than anything else, then these techniques are going to come to us. It means that you are worshiping your own peace. The true self in you. How can you do this? How can you worship your own peace, the true self in you? How can you do it? Constantly remember, this is the only thing that will save me and will keep me happy always, my peace. Spiritual practice. To remember what keeps me happy always is my peace. So when I lose it, I notice. Ah, I'm experiencing a loss of peace that God has given through me. And I'm remembering that now. There is no other way. Keep me happy always, my peace. Constantly remember. So keep an eye on it, your own peace. Whenever you do, see that you are still maintaining your peace as you do it. So whatever you're up to, see if you can maintain your peace. Another technique. The moment you feel you're forgetting the peace, it's all slipping away, immediately say, no, I care more for my peace than anything else. Losing your peace. No, I care more for my peace than anything else. Even if you could give me the whole world, the place of my peace or in place of my peace I wouldn't trade that I just want my peace and peace alone this is a way of focusing our minds I'm worshipping my peace we can think of absolute peace on our spiritual path as the divine 
And we're experiencing absolute peace like being in the present moment. That's the delight. So let's see, I have about five two. We have enough time for the exercise. Would you like to do the exercise? And then we'll close. In the exercise, there's two ways to do it. One is uh, you can watch the screen as I repeat the steps. Or two, you may choose to close your eyes and uh, repeat uh, the exercise as I repeat it to you. It's useful as you hear the instructions in the exercise to repeat them to yourself silently. So I'll give you a few moments to do that. When you repeat an exercise to yourself silently, you internalize it more. Okay? So let's get our feet in touch with Mother Earth and take a deep breath. And here we go. Think of something recent that gave you anxiety. Think of something recent that gave you anxiety. Think of the object of that anxiety. Think of the object of that anxiety. Think of an outcome associated with that anxiety. Think of an outcome associated with that anxiety. Were you feeling anxious about that outcome? You can ask yourself, were you feeling anxious about that outcome? Did expectation of that outcome disturb your peace? Did expectation of that outcome disturb your peace? In this moment, are you willing to let the Lord take responsibility for all outcomes? In this moment, are you willing to let the Lord take responsibility for all outcomes? Are you willing to experience your peace now? Are you willing to experience your peace now? Right now, ask yourself, what is the state of your peace? Right now, Are you feeling peace? That's the exercise.
constantly ask will this disturb my peace? Am I selling my peace to get something? Constantly ask, will this disturb my peace? Am I selling my peace to get something? Let's take three conscious breaths together. And the deep in breath. And go in peace. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you.